What is going on Babylonians? It's me Songs of Rays back with another synced video to bring to you and today we are going to be looking at the new look PvE mode for the open beta and how to get you up and running straight away. Talking about tips and tricks, how to mod your character effectively and everything you'll witness in Dead Sector 1 so nothing gets in your way of that full clear and all the juicy rewards. Just note all these tips will be from the first PvE level and Sector 2 has some changes with level layouts and mechanics so while this will give you the basics for PvE in general be on the lookout for the next few guides talking everything special to do with Se Dead Sectors 2 through 5. But anyway, we've got quite a few categories to be able to cover in this video, so let's get right into it. Your first choice for PvE success rests on which runner you plan on taking into the Meridian, or with their pros and cons, but the choice can sometimes mean the difference between failure and success. It's important to take into consideration what the runner can do and what special ability they pack to aid the team. For some it's more obvious, but looking at the runners themselves we can advise which work well kit-wise in PvE and which don't offer enough to be able to warrant that trusty pick. For instance, looking at Dr. Stone having an amazing support package in Healer's Aura, summoning a static circle of healing and auto-revive capability so that if the worst does happen you have that on hand to get the team back up and running. Pair this with his combat medic perk, meaning the doc can pick runners up and use medkits faster than other selections, and medical marvel which allows him to recover more health when reviving and using the medkits. I'm sure you can agree from the sounds of it, Dr. Stone has the perfect gear for taking on the strongest of levels, but this makes him a top tier pick in Sync's current state. As for the rest of the band, it's not so clear cut and their roles are more defined by the player and their use of their gadget. Deadcut is a favourite of yours truly, gaining increased DPS from Fire Reflection's obvious grenade ability in Dragon's Breath perk, setting alight the target hit by the last bullet of each magazine. The grenade ability has some amazing crowd control and with its wild, wide application and lasting area of fire, helping towards status powered builds. You can crank out some serious numbers with Deadcut and so is more of a DPS option to take in should that be your thing. The same can be said for Glory, although more of a direct DPS increase thanks to her The Tracker perk, increasing nano weak point damage as opposed to a lasting damage over time. Her gadget of Smoke Bomb is similar to that of Deadcut's Grenade, but not quite as impactful. She may be top tier in PvP, but in PvE she's massively outclassed by other picks. Ragnar is the aggressive choice for runners in PvE, specialising in recovering health from stunned enemies with the Radiant Eye ability, and Death Defy offering even more health on top of that when killing Prime Nanos, which are in abundance in this mode. If you find you're starting to struggle survivability wise as a solo, Ragnar could be the way to go while your armor recharges, just be make sure to grab as many stun mods as you can from the exchanges to maximise your leech chances. Lastly we have Park, unlocked from playing the beta and completing daily rewards, and boy is he worth it the unlock if you love shooting guns. His kit tends to that of LMGs as your main weapon, and holding the trigger down until the mag runs dry. Steady Hand, offering reduced recoil the longer the trigger is held, and bloody bullets generating ammo for your gun from your kills with your ability and any weak point kills that you do make. As for Park's ability, Chain Bomb, this is a simple fire and forget allowing it to chain between nanos and deliver some deadly blows. Park was made with PvE in mind and I'd happily put him near the top tier for DPS for how well his kit works together. Just bear in mind to get the most out of his kit you will need to prioritise LMGs as the weapon of choice. Whatever you pick, you really can't go wrong in the PvE mode to begin with, but as the challenge increases and synergistic builds become more relevant, it's important to know which of the runners you need to fall back on and work better than others. If I was to suggest a main to get you used to right off the bat, Dr. Stone and Deadcut will be the best to get going, with Park being great once you unlock him. Just in case you thought the class building stopped at your runner and weapon choices, you'll be pleased to know that every runner can equip up to 4 mods that can help achieve certain tasks. Think of mods as universal perks that all runners can equip to help them out in the Meridian, but are usually more powerful than PvP perks as none of the nanos will call for a nerf to your favourite mod. Mods include, but are not limited to, weak point kills replenishing bullets in your mag, health and armour regenerating faster, weapon damage increases after a critical hit, or everyone's early favourite of empty mag reloads dropping an explosive for even more area of effect damage. There are a bunch more to be found and to be equipped so keep your eyes peeled for mods that can be acquired through job rewards and pickups from just playing the mode in general. But finding mods is only the tip of the iceberg as the mod's power level directly affects your own power level, meaning higher tier ones will be more effective than others. A higher number means a higher power score, affecting how strong you are going to be in those PvE missions. This is how the game's soft gate keeps you from just going through all 5 PvE missions back to back, requiring you to go back to previously completed missions for more resources and better mods to be able to improve your level. 
Fortunately, you only need one of the mods you'd like to continually upgrade and take with you to the endgame as the game offers an enhanced function. When you have two mods, one you like and one is low leveled and one that you don't care for and is a higher level, you can transfer the power score from one to the other at the cost of dismantling the one you transferred from. This means you no longer need to farm repeatedly a level to min-max your power score on a certain mod where you can just transfer the stats across. It's more player friendly, but does take away some of the grind. It'll be interesting to see how the full player base responds to that, but so far it sounds like you replay for the fun of the game and not out of necessity. Lastly, we get to look at one of the cooler functions to run a build where each and every mod can have additional perks on top of them. This is called Augmenting and will require another resource to help perform the action, which isn't as commonplace as Nerva, unfortunately. Each mod has the potential for four augments to be applied, offering a random PvE bonus tribute when the mod is equipped. Augmenting has the potential to get expensive after the first one or two as it requires a scarce resource which seemingly can only be found in the PvP modes currently. If this location does change, I will leave a pinned comment on the video advising where else this can be found to be able to assist those players, so make sure you have a check down there. Augmenting is fairly simple and is quick to perform, but all you need to do is select the mod you want to be able to upgrade and press the E button on the PC. This will bring up a separate window displaying all current augments and the cost for adding a new one on. Current augments I have come across have been boost to crit chance and health for your companion nano and damage boost to a specific category of weapons like shotguns and LMGs. With that in mind it's safe to assume that ARs and SMGs will also be included in those categories as well. Almost every stat of a runner can be increased through the use of augments and this will be where the second part of builds will come into it alongside the RNG factor of getting the right rolls. I have also witnessed different coloured text to certain mods suggesting that there is some kind of rarity pull to either the attributes rolled or to the stats that they bring. But once again, when that info has been found out, I will put that down as part of the pinned comment. Anyways, that's all you can do before you get into the dead sectors, so let's have a look into the tips for when you do drop in. When you first drop into the Meridian, your drop point can be one of several found across the map. Currently, we know of two drop points with the potential to have more on top of that, encouraging you to explore other parts of the map and so that not every game is the exact same. This area is free of nanos and allows you to gain your bearings before heading off to explore and complete the level. While you won't find too much to look at or in the ways of loot, you should find some items of assistance nearby after scouting for a minute or two. Your first course of action should be to find another weapon, preferably of a higher rarity, and a set of armour to offer some protection from your precious health values as the armour regenerates after a set amount of time. Once you have your bearings and some extra gear, your next goal is to start tackling the nano threat head on, which leads us perfectly on to the next point. While out and about in the level, surge storms make up the main objective for the mode, offering a horde of nanos to eliminate along with at least one elite nano. Doing so clears the storm and creates a safe haven from the surge difficulty, allowing you to heal up and perform actions for a certain length of time before the shield collapses and the percentage starts to rise again, but we'll learn more about that later on in this guide. Clearing Surge Storms is widely considered the fastest way to achieve this objective for the level and to activate the Surge Formation to move on to the next, but it's important to learn the difference between Normal Surge Storms and Elite Surge Storms to prepare you for what's going to be ahead. Normal Surge Storms come in the shape of a purple nano tornado and spawn the regular spread of nanos and an Elite to be able to take on. Elite Nano Storms offer something a little bit more different by adding in a modifier to the nanos but still usually dropping around about the same number of nanos that would have spawned initially. For example, an Elite Surge Storm will drop a Locus Elite Nano and some Melee Nanos backed up by some Cannon Nanos. On top of this, Modifier is applied to them all, like for example Surge Rush, which offers plus 50% health and plus 100% damage to all the Nanos that have spawned, including the Elite, making them much harder to take down as well as being able to hit you for harder. Other modifiers do exist, but that list is still being worked on, so keep your eyes out for another video on that one. Once the last enemy of a Surge Storm is taken down, you'll gain the progress and your minimap will start directing you towards the next one. For new players, hearing me suggest that you tackle Elite Nanos early on in a run might sound a bit crazy, and in some part it is, but Elite Nanos offer one of the biggest boosts of power to your runner in the form of your very own Synced Nano. Defeating an Elite Nano leaves their body behind for you to manually sync with and produce one of four Nanos to use at your disposal between the Crusher, the Seer, the Suppressor and the Guardian. Each one of these offer a different boost when attached to your arm and then offer different benefits when deployed in the field, further enhanced through equipable mods to improve their current abilities or to even add brand new ones. Having a synced nano is worth the fight of taking on elite nanos and should be done whenever you have the chance and feel able. If you want to know more about the synced nanos then I highly recommend that you watch our video that is going to be showing on the screen right now. 
But then, as for the Elite Nanos themselves, the enemies, they come in several different forms and each have their own dangers to watch out for. Whether it's punishing melee attacks, dangerous range bombardments, or summoning lightning to strike you down, you'll always be on your toes around them until you deal enough damage. Fortunately, Elite Nanos have a two-stage mechanic to their defeat, meaning if enough of their health bar disappears, they start to take a knee in a version of what the runners do when they're down but not out state. This can then either be used as a window to plow more bullets into them or to fully eliminate, or if you have enough chance you can run up to the sink or and execute the Elite right there and then. Either way of killing the Elite Nano will provide a currency to the player, just note that you can sync with the host either in this kneeling state or after a full kill, so don't feel pressured into getting to them when they're in the kneeling animation, finish them off and claim your prize. If you've played the tutorial, even once you'll know what exchanges offer to a runner and how to find the resource needed to be able to buy more. But what if I told you that the exchanges in PvE are extremely important and probably what you should dump 75-90% to of your radiate into for a run? Yes, they really are that important, so let's dive into why. Runner mods are what make a build and what help a run to compete in an ever more dangerous meridian. Mods can help give you armor back faster, give damage boosts when reloading or even when activating abilities, so are always pretty impactful. Each run starts you off with a choice of up to four, as we've already established, which you set before the run starts. Have you ever looked at a mod or a perk in a game and wished you could run that as well? Well now you can with the exchanges and getting lucky when you deposit your radia. For the small price of 200 radia for your first initial exchange, you can roll the slot machine of runner perks and take your pick from one of two choices, offering anywhere between mods that you've already unlocked but not equipped, to mods already equipped and to upgrade them, to mods for your nano and to unlock new abilities and upgrades, even on top of all of that. As you can imagine, the pool is going to be huge and to try and find the right one you need is pure looking guesswork, but each purchase of a mod will increase the next cost by 100 radia, so 200 becomes 300, 300 becomes 400, and so on. If you have the radia, the exchange has the drops for you. But why would I recommend spending so much radia here, I hear you ask? Well, the answer is simple. While your weapon rarity does increase your damage and is massively important to level up to keep up that high DPS, runner mods in combination with other mods offer more effective ways to deal with crowds as well as single target damage. Want to deal damage with through reloads? The Reload Blast mod has you covered, offering a bouncy mine to make its way through hordes for damaging blasts. Want to stun enemies more frequently? Then Weak Point Stun offers a chance at every single time you land a Weak Point shot on an enemy nano. The full pool of mods available is currently being worked on, but synergies already exist and it's up to the runner to get lucky but also to look at making the right call on what mods help you out and what can be ignored. In a nutshell, the more mods you have, the easier the run gets for you. While the mode does encourage the player to be fairly linear with their approach to PvE and get into the objective as quickly as possible, don't be afraid to deviate from the fastest path and explore what the Meridian has to offer. Doing so will allow the runner to encounter two specific places of importance to maximise a run's effectiveness and offer some substantial rewards, especially if you're lucky. The first of which will be caches, boxes found across the play area holding juicy numbers of both Nerva and Radia, along with other items such as armour and ammo pouches. While having the one cache on its own isn't a lot of currency for helping bump the power up, power up of your runner, multiples are spread out across the play area, offering huge bumps in currency for your current run and when you get back to Haven. As for the item drops themselves, ammo pouches allow you to hold more reserve ammo depending on what rarity you are carrying, but can mean the difference between still using your primary in a fight or swapping to a pistol to get to an ammo supply. Last but definitely not least will be the armor drops, which by themselves save you a bunch of radia being spent at the shops to upgrade yourself. Typically in Dead Sector 1, Round 1 caches can offer grey and blue armor drops, while Round 2 upgrades further to blue, purple and even legendary armor for free and all it took was a few steps out of your way to go grab. These upgrades alone can save you 1.2k or 2k radia at a shop, all of which could have been spent on weapon upgrades or at exchanges for more powerful mods. Speaking of weapons though, safe houses are the other locations worth finding in the Meridian as these offer huge benefits to runners once opened up. These can be found on the minimap with a shutter door icon and need to be interacted with to open up and receive the goodies. Inside of every safe house will be a bunch of currency for Radia and Nerva, a shop, an ammo supply and a few weapon drops of increased rarity including melee items and pistols. But what makes the safe houses so special will be those weapon drops, offering a slim chance of gaining a fully kitted out golden gun complete with a special weapon mod. Now these weapon mods can only be found on your initial starting weapon if you've unlocked one for use and equipped it, or on legendary weapons found within the level. There doesn't seem to be a guaranteed drop for any of these and they can be found as early as the first round, so just keep opening all the safe houses you find and hopefully one will drop. 
always keep an eye out in the top right minimap for any icons or caches or safe houses and make a beeline over there for the precious rewards found inside. Weapon rarity in the PvE mode is especially important as the rarity determines the damage modifier the gun will do to nanos and bosses when shooting. Grey is the basic level for guns which you take in, with upgrades to rare, epic and legendary on offer through purchases in the shop with Radia or from finding new weapons on the ground and in safe houses coming pre-upgraded. Finding pre-upgraded weapons usually tends to help your runs as they save you a bunch of radio which can then go on to other items and upgrades, but also level up weapons you've yet to unlock, so once you have them in the haven you can fit them as you need. I say usually as sometimes it offers weapons which don't fit your runner or your playstyle, like for example Park has a kit designed for LMGs, so picking up a shotgun as a primary might not be the best course to be able to take. Make sure to factor this in when choosing which weapons you are carrying and into the rest of the run. Weapon mods are ways to change your weapon's performance, with each class of weapon having four to choose from so far. These can be unlocked in Haven to take out in the field by completing some sort of milestone or task, with the stronger ones being locked behind later milestones. These can range from SMGs being able to break armour at the cost of a smaller mag, being able to fire penetrating blades instead of bullets, that return to the fire and stun enemies on their way back, a mod that empties the entire SMG mag in one press of the fire button, and sniper mods that restore the bullet right back into the magazine should you miss the shot. It's best to use these around your builds, giving your gun some nice versatility for what you're trying to pull off. Make sure to factor in any negatives the mod may offer with those upsides, as firing a whole mag of ammo into a normal nano may mean that you run dry faster than you intended. Legendary weapons found in the Meridian also come with a weapon mod attached, offering the description of the mod in its weapon card and allowing you to be able to play around with mods before you unlock them. So as you can imagine, legendary weapons are pretty sought after, making any run you find them in much easier. Just note that trying to upgrade a weapon at the shop to legendary will give you the damage boost, but it won't give you the random weapon mod, so only weapons that spawn in as legendary have those attached. Shops can be a great station to visit if you have some spare radio around and need to upgrade your main weapon, have an armour falling behind, could use a sync host or need some precious medkits to stay in the fight. All four are on offer and are easily offered without having to go into a shop window or even a separate menu. All you need to do is aim at the item you're looking to be able to upgrade or purchase and press the interact key to buy with your radio. The prices for these items vary in the case of weapon and armour upgrades as higher levels require more currency and stay stagnant usually for the buyables in the case of medkits. While shops are important, it can be deceiving for their use as they'll tempt you to spend your precious radia on items that you don't need to. In my experience, buying upgrades on weapons and armour can be a waste depending where you are in the level and how your luck has been. Reason being, upgraded weapons and higher tier armour can be found all around the meridian from caches and safe houses, meaning just a little exploration while completing the objective can net you everything you need for that last fight gear-wise, freeing up those funds for exchange mods and other items. My personal advice for radius spending should be to save as much as you can until the boss fight, where you get offered an exchange and a shop before you go in, meaning you can drop all your currency in there for the power creep needed to tackle the boss. Of course, if you need a few mods to help during rounds, always go to exchanges and shop to buy what you need, but the more you can keep, the better off decision-wise you'll be in that end encounter. As you go about your run, on the right hand side under the minimap will be a counter slowly ticking up for surge difficulty. This will start making its way up to 100%, by which not only will the nanos have leveled to max for the area, you'll start taking continual damage to your health until either your character runs out and it's game over, or you complete the area. With this in mind, it's usually best to try and finish the current level as quickly as you can. With the levelling in mind, at certain thresholds the surge difficulty will change in threat level. When this happens, all nanos you then face for the current stage will increase in levels, meaning more HP and more damage to contend with coming your way. For the threshold, easy difficulty is between 0 and 20%, medium is 21 to 66%, and hard begins at 67% onwards to 100 when maxed out, so keep your eye on the bar to make sure not to be caught out when it changes. While you are rewarded for exploring around the Meridian for the nice rewards and currency, make sure to balance that against your surge difficulty so you don't screw yourselves over. Surge formations take the place as level bosses, but in the grand scheme of the Dead Sector runs, function similar to that of a mini boss, having an on-screen health bar and having waves to their attacks to take down. When you first approach the formation, nanos will be in the area and need to be eliminated before you can even start. Once defeated, you'll have the ability to scan the formation with your scarab to then kickstart the encounter. Once the fight kicks off, the surge formation gains its health bar, a weak point will present itself at times for maximum damage potential, and the formation will start to fight back. This comes in the shape of two main phases, depending where the health bar currently sits. 
While the formation is up and able to be damaged, it will spawn four rows of spikes to hit the players for damage and a stagger, and then follow up with the detonation for even more damage. Chances are that if you are hit with the initial impact, the detonation will hit you as well, so be careful and watch your health bar. Fortunately, where these spikes will come out of it is pretty obvious, as the base of the formation will glow for a second or two from the spawn point, allowing you a chance to move before they hit you. These shouldn't give the player too much difficulty of getting through unless you're focused on the weak point too much. Once the formation loses a third of its health it will retreat so no more damage can be done to it, and then a spawn a large pack of nanos with an elite or two to pester you. After a set amount of time or after the pack has been killed off, the formation will return allowing you to damage them again for the next segment of their health to then repeat a second time. Upon landing the final blow to the formation it will explode and advise the objective is complete, leaving you to the spoils of your win. After you finish the surge formation, a bunch of currency and usually one runner mod will drop as a reward, so you're always working towards some kind of progression even if you don't complete the full mission. Make sure to collect these and quick, as once you've beaten the surge a 20 second timer will start ticking away, so use this time to quickly access nearby items of interest like ammo boxes or hunt down a nearby cache, as once the 20 seconds are up, you won't be revisiting this area again. After completing a level, all players will be shown the round summary screen, allowing everyone to see what scores they've achieved through damage and support when picking players up. This score isn't just for show though, as getting to this screen allows players to choose from exclusive mods only found at this screen. These mods are available on a first come first serve basis, and this is where the round score tends to come in. The player with the highest score gets the opportunity to pick out of all three on which mod they want, and the second highest choosing after that, leaving the last place position with whatever mod is remaining. The mods themselves from what I've seen so far include discounts at exchanges, discounts at shops, increases in runner attack power and increases in runner health values. Throughout a game, some of these mods can appear in consecutive rounds, meaning that stacking is most definitely possible. For example, having two mods of 20% discount at exchanges does in quite in fact equal a 40% discount of radio cost for using, allowing some heavy mod stacking. I can see solo matchmaking being an absolute free-for-all on the more popular mods like Attack Power, but it also opens up the ground for or anyone, any kind of team synergy when it comes to voice comms, and to organise and choose mods based on who needs them. These only apply to the current game though, so once it's finished these mods disappear and you'll need to start a new game to be able to collect them again for that benefit. In Dead Sector 1, progressing to the second round will start to mix things up with the encounters. The enemies will jump in level and difficulty, meaning better weapons and armour is almost essential to get through unscathed. Pretty standard stuff from what you'd expect until you run around the level and a mysterious purple glow starts to appear around your feet and affecting the ground around you. These are random surge encounters serving as a way to spawn a pack, nano pack and elite where you may be ill prepared. On the plus side, taking these spires down does offer some nice radiant and nerve as a reward, so it's worthwhile taking them on if you can. Once you notice the purple area, you'll want to move out of its way to be able to create some space and then either deal with the pack nanos or the spire first, depending on what is faster for your current DPS. While there isn't anything particularly special about the nanos here, the spire does have a weak point, allowing you to be able to focus fire and take it down much faster. The glowing red fragments are where you need to be able to aim to do this, and the spire has a number of them so no matter the angle you are looking towards, it should give you one in view. Similar to Surge Storms, defeating the nanos and the spire will cause a wave to release, allowing some respite from the surge difficulty while it exists. As long as you have the ammo and the DPS, it's always worth taking these on to earn some nice currency drops. The main spoils of your PvE run will be to obtain rare drops called runner mods, purple drops that once you go back to Haven will turn into unlocked mods with varying power levels. These mods form the backbone of every build in sync and getting the right ones paired together with high power levels affect how hard you can hit the nanos around and how easy of a time you'll have in the levels. While we are still working on the full list of mods available, it is worth noting that some mods you can only equip in this menu and do not appear in exchanges while out in the field. That being said, taking a mod you know exists in the exchanges allows you to be able to skip the first level and go straight to its legendary unlock, making it more powerful without the need to use the machine a minimum of two times to get the original mod and then upgrade it. As a PSA, it is worth mentioning some mods are clearly stronger than others and will help make your time easier in the Meridian. Make sure to have a look through all your new mod unlocks when you get back, because you never know, that perfect mod may now be available to you. So this is it, you've made it to the boss, everything you've done has prepared you for this, now it's time to put it all to use. And then you see the health bar on the screen and how little you're doing to it and you know you're in for a slog. Even with legendary gear, the tyrant class bosses are bullet sponges and you'll need to keep your wits about you for the attacks that they can hit you with. 
Fortunately, you do get to keep your Synced Nano if you had them around before now, and you do have access to an exchange in the shop to spend the last of your radio for those last upgrades. If your armor and weapons aren't legendary rarity yet, this is going to be the perfect time to correct that. The first tyrant you face is all about getting up close and being in your face to lay on the hurt. Watch out for his teleport dash as this will cause some serious damage and can one hit you in some cases. Other moves of note are his charging dash, allowing the tyrant to smash through his own nano floor spikes to surprise you for a big hit, and their shield move allowing them to close the gap while taking no frontal damage as they creep closer. We will be covering a proper full guide on Dead Sector 1 down the line, so don't want to give too many tricks away here, but just remember to be able to keep your dodge roll button handy to quickly get away out of the way of his moves and you should be fine. When shooting, remember to aim for the glowing orange shoulder crystals as these are weak points and will offer a nice bump in the damage you deal and mean less time taking him down. If you do run out of ammo, don't be afraid to run to the edges of the arena and use one of five ammo dumps. If you need more med kits, the nanos that get summoned have a chance to be over dropping them, so feel free to mow a few down and try and get that health pack. Once defeated, a short cutscene will start playing and the rewards will spawn in the centre of the room, consisting of a chunk of Nerva and a few runner mods. Usually two or three in my experience, but after collecting a tra transition to Haven will start to begin and then lead you to a round summary screen for damage, teammates revived and the share of damage done to the tyrant in case you fancy a friendly competition between your teammates. Getting back to Haven though will treat you with an XP breakdown for your run and then open all of your collected runner mods showing you what you now have access to and their appropriate power level. Once all examined, moving to the next screen then shows the progress towards that dead sector's chest, which if enough points are gathered allows you to open for rewards specific to that chest. This can range from exclusive weapon mods to skins and other useful items, but this may take more than one run to be able to complete. Make sure to collect all rewards from that crate to be able to complete your collection. And there we have it, with all of that info dump, that is it on the video. This is the part where I want to hear from you, how are you finding the PvE mode? Will it be the mode you main over PvP to grind out those perfect mods and augments? Let me know in the comment section down below. As mentioned before, if there are any kind of changes to this information already mentioned and found in this video, I will be leaving amendments in the pinned comment so this will always be relevant. As for the levels themselves, we will be releasing separate guides for each to be able to help learn the ins and outs and overall mechanics of the levels and the boss fights. Massive thank you for making your way to the end of this video and to the Babylonian family for their continued support. If you haven't already, come join us over on the Discord where we talk daily with the community and we'd love to hear your views on game titles and links can be found in the video description below. With all that out of the way, it just leaves me to say, keep yourself safe, keep yourselves well, and I'll see you all on our next video.